grab a cup of coffee, sit back and listen to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life features stories to inspire and motivate you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Visit CYACYL.com. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Is your definition of a good life measured by health, positive relationships, and happiness, or is it defined by financial wealth and material possessions? Many people today are so preoccupied with money and collecting things that they're deprived of experiencing joy in life. In recent years, millions have been thrust into financial trouble due to inflation, layoffs, and debt. John Robbins, a crusader for lifestyle choices, has realized that there's an upside to our financial downturn the opportunity to reassess our lives and values. The only son of the founder of the Baskin Robbins ice cream empire, John was groomed to follow in his father's footsteps, but chose to walk away from Baskin Robbins and the immense wealth it represented in order to pursue the deeper American dream. John's the author of nine bestsellers, including The New Good Life, Healthy at 100, The Food Revolution, Diet for a New America, and most recently, No Happy Cows, Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Food Revolution. He's a blogger on the Huffington Post, and his work has been the subject of feature articles in many newspapers and magazines. His life and work have also been featured in an award-winning PBS special, Diet for a New America. Welcome, John. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Joan. Glad to be here. John, you're the heir to the Baskin-Robbins empire, and yet you've turned your back on that. And I'm sure that there are people sitting home now that are barely getting by financially, and someone has to be saying, is he crazy? I mean, what was it that motivated you to go in a different direction and forge your own life path? Well, my father thought I was crazy. He had worked very hard, and he had achieved a level of financial success that most people can only dream about, and he wanted to share that with his only son. And he groomed me to succeed him uh, at Baskin Robbins. But I was pulled in a different direction. And um, my uncle, Bert Baskin, my dad's partner and brother-in-law, died of a heart attack in his early 50s. He was a very big man, and he ate a lot of ice cream. And at the time, I asked my dad, do you think there could be a connection between Bert Baskin's fatal heart attack, the co-owner of Baskin Robbins, and his, the amount of ice cream that he would eat. And my dad said, oh, absolutely not. His ticker just got tired and stopped working. And I looked into my dad's eyes that moment, and I saw implacable denial. And I could understand why. He didn't want to think that the family product might be killing anybody or injuring anybody, particularly his beloved brother-in-law and partner. But and, and at that moment, by that moment, my father had, and in fact, manufactured and sold more ice cream than any human being who'd ever lived on the planet. He, he couldn't bear to think that, that ice cream might be, be a bad thing. And, and an ice cream cone isn't going to kill anybody or hurt anybody, but the more you eat, the more likely you are to have heart disease, like killed my uncle, Bert Baskin. And it's not just Baskin-Robbins, by the way. I, I, I think of Ben and Jerry's. Um, ben Cohen, the, the co-owner for many years and um, co-founder of Ben & Jerry's, had a quintuple bypass in his late 40s. Ben Cohen is a beautiful human being. He's also a very big man who, who ate a lot of ice cream, like my uncle, Bert Baskin. And so I began to feel that ice cream was not a good thing in quantity. And if you're going to sell it, if you're going to manufacture it, if you're in the business, you want people to eat as much as possible because that's how you make your profit. So I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to sell a product or derive my my livelihood from selling a product that was harming anybody or might be harming anybody. I wanted my life force to be used to contribute to the health and well-being of people so people's lives could be a little healthier, a little more beautiful, a little more loving. So I I told my dad I wasn't going to work with him at Baskin Robbins. And then I realized in order to be in integrity with that choice, I needed to walk away from the money as well. I needed to uh, live by my own values and seek my own powers, and um, not depend in any way on his financial achievements. I was a young man at the time, um, and this was this is um, 45 years ago, and I made that decision and, and walked away from the money, um, told him I did not want to have a trust fund, didn't want to, to have any access to his wealth whatsoever, and that's how I've lived in these, these many years since. Have you ever regretted that decision? 
Never for a second. I've been poor. I have regretted not having more money. <laughs> but, but not that decision, because it's interesting. You know, I, I did give up a great deal of financial security, but ironically, I felt more emotionally secure because I was now living an authentic life. I wasn't pretending to be somebody I wasn't. I wasn't trying to placate my father's expectations at the cost of my inner life. I, I was now listening to my inner guidance, to my inner voice, my higher wisdom or inner wisdom, and I was trying to align to that rather than becoming lost in, in playing the, the, the ice cream game. John, I think what happens with so many of us is we're always waiting to accomplish that goal to be happy. So we spend our lives saying, when I get that job, I'll be happy. When I hit this much money in the bank, I'll be happy. And we're always waiting for that something to happen. But with that said, when we're struggling financially and we don't have the luxury of financial freedom, how do we have the luxury to focus on joy? Well, sometimes you just have to choose to be happy um, with what is, because what is is not going to change, and, and you do have some power over your own attitude. That is one place we have leverage, is the, the, the attitude we bring to life. And if we count our blessings and appreciate what we can and live with gratitude when possible, um, our lives tend to hum better. There tends to be more joy in them and more opportunities to express beauty and, and, and give of ourselves and evoke the best in others. I think that's the real success in life. Well, and that's the key. Stop waiting for what we don't have and focus on what it is we do have. It is, and, and I do not condone the economic system that is depriving so many people who work hard of an opportunity for a decent life and... Um, I don't like a lot of things that are happening in our economy, and I, I, I really think the, the division of wealth, the 1% accumulating more and more and the 99% having less and less, is a disaster. I think it's a tragedy, and, and we need to work politically and economically to change that. At the same time, let us do so from as much joy, from as much positivity, from as, as much gratitude as possible, because that way we will be more effective in, in uh, creating the political changes that we need to do so there's more social justice, so there's more opportunity for people, so that people aren't, aren't feeling like wage slaves and deprived of their basic needs. We, we really want to take care of each other, and we can do so best when we're coming from a feeling and an attitude of gratitude. I like when you say that we should take this difficult time and use it to really look inside and reassess what's important to us in our lives, our values, our belief system. And what would you say would be some of the things that people should be really looking at during this time? Well, when you say somebody is a success in our society, what do you mean? Don't usually, when we use the word success, we mean that they've made a lot of money or they have a lot of money somehow. That's how we, as a culture, define success. And I, we do so in material terms, in, the, in, in monetary terms. And I think that when we do it that, when we define success that way, we actually impoverish ourselves. Um, because to me, a truly successful human being isn't necessarily someone who has money. I mean, how did they make that money? Uh, what do they do with that money? To me, a truly successful person is someone who, whatever their financial status, he brings out the best in other people, uh, l loves well, loves wisely, um, to pays attention to themselves and to others in a way that has respect in it, communicates well with others, uh, li lives essentially with, with reverence for life, with respect for themselves and, and all other beings. To me, those are the kinds of things that make a person successful, whereas just having money, I have known some people who have a great deal of money, but I would not consider them successful human beings at all. They, they're actually very, very uh, frightened, insecure, uh, unhappy, and some of them do damaging things to others out of their addictions and out of their, their, their difficulties. I, I, I don't consider those people to be exemplars to me of success, even though they're, they're financially wealthy. And I think that this is a very good time, like you're saying, that, that we have to take the emphasis off of the money and that definition of success and really focus on what's important. And is that what you mean when you talk about the new good life? Yes, the new good life to me, see, the old good life was he who dies with the most toys wins. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, maybe the new good life is something like uh, she who lives with the most joys 
shares. And I think that, you know, from doing this work, I, I meet so many people, and people are really hungry to find joy. And I think that you're hitting the nail on the head, that it's time for us to put all of those superficial things aside and focus on joy and happiness and being true to ourselves. Exactly. And I think, you know, I'm not trying to minimize the economic pressures that people feel. Those are real. But in meeting those pressures, if we can come from a feeling of gratitude and thankfulness for the blessings that, in fact, we still have and do, in fact, have, they tend to to grow. If you appreciate the people in your life, those relationships will tend to thrive. People like to be appreciated. And I have seen that that when, when you care for, one, for your friends and your loved ones, the people in the circle of your care, uh, um, that circle expands, and you have a richer life, more friends, the relationships in your family get better. And that's part of our real wealth, I think, is our relationships with one another. I think we don't sometimes remember the treasures we have in each other. John, we need to take a break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life now has a free monthly digital magazine that can be read online or emailed to your inbox. Each month, nationally recognized leaders in their field provide the information that you need to inspire and motivate you. We believe in a holistic approach to life incorporating mind, body, and spirit. As philosopher Francis Bacon said, knowledge is power. Use the wisdom provided in the publication and apply it to your everyday life. Visit CYACYL.com for more information or to begin your free subscription. That's CYACYL.com. Welcome back to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman, and our guest today is John Robbins. John's a best-selling author and a leader in helping people assess their lives and values in order to create health and well-being. John, before break, we were talking about The New Good Life, but you also wrote a book that's entitled Healthy at 100, in which you say that anyone at any age can dramatically increase their lifespan. So what type of changes do you believe we need to make in order to add years to our lives? Well, actually, I'm more interested in increasing our health span, and that's a little different. Of course, everyone wants to live to a ripe old age, but the important thing is that it be ripe, (laughs) that you Mm -hmm. mature in a healthy way. Simply adding years without adding healthy years, to me, is not such a big deal, and it's not something that I'm particularly motivated about but that people, as they age, retain their, their cognitive capacities, that they retain their virility, their vitality, that they retain their flexibility and, and their ability to connect with, each, with other people in a positive way. Um, that's important, that they retain their ability to enjoy life, and in fact, not just retain it, but actually expand it, actually grow it in some way, so that as you mature, you, you find life getting richer, not necessarily in the bank account way, but richer in the ways that, that matter in your heart and in your soul and in your connections with other people. That is possible. And, and I, in Healthy at 100, my book, I wrote extensively about what we've learned about those choices and lifestyles and experiences and attitudes at, that enable a human being to age in a way that, that where there's more beauty and, um, and enhanced capacity for life in their later years. John, what are some of the things that you've learned? What are some of the key points from your book? Well, one of them is diet. You want to eat a simple diet. You want to eat, actually, uh, uh, eat real food, not processed foods. Um, Derive as many of your uh, nutrients from plant sources as possible. Um, Not much meat or dairy products, if any. And you want to not eat too much. Restrict, it's in some ways, some people feel it as a, a deprivation, but really when you overconsume calories and cholesterol and fat and sugar and salt, what happens is you, you, you become obese, you become overweight, you become likely to become diabetic, you, you increase greatly your likelihood of having heart disease, or, and you increase your rates of many kinds of cancer. That's how you undermine healthy aging. And if you eat a simpler diet, um, and, and eat simply so others can simply eat also. You, 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 you share, and, and we then can thrive much more. Also, you want to exercise regularly. Don't smoke, wear a seatbelt. A lot of this stuff is common sense, mm-hmm. but a lot of us don't do it. And, and, and one of the keys, by the way, that, that isn't so obvious, that even seems counterintuitive a little bit to some people, to healthy aging, 
is our social connectivity. The studies all show that those people who feel they have positive, healthy, thriving relationships with other people age better. They live longer, but perhaps more even, even more importantly, those, those, those added years are healthy ones. John, the people that you interviewed, are there commonalities? Are they all doing what you're suggesting? Yes, they are. They all eat by what we would call, by our, our American current standards, a low-calorie diet. They eat less than we do normally. Now, not all of us, but most of us are heavy. Most of us are heavier than we would optimally be. And I don't mean from a vanity point of view, though that may be true also, but from a health point of view. And um, as a result of our carrying extra baggage around, extra weight, and usually it's extra fat, we are, we are a less healthy people. And we are more prone to dementia as we get older, Alzheimer's and other forms. We are more prone to cancers as we get older. We are more prone to um, circulatory diseases, respiratory diseases. Um, Our immune system doesn't function as well as it could. And as a result of that, we are more likely to come down with infectious diseases, and those diseases are likely to do more damage to us than they would if our immune systems were functioning better, which they would if we ate less. It's one of the secrets, actually, is to eat less than we often do. But we have so many forces in our society eat, saying eat more. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much advertising and marketing for foods. So many of our convenience foods, foods are, are high in calories and high in sugar and fat, and they don't provide the nutrients we need. They provide uh, just a lot of extra stuff and extra calories. I saw this ad one time. I remember growing up in the 60s when we went to a restaurant, which was a very rare treat, but if you did you would get a a hamburger, which was really a a very small burger, and sides were very small. And then they compared the plate that was served in the 60s and 70s to what is is served now. Everything is supersized and jumboed and and maxed out. And and like you're saying, if you looked at the amount of food that we were eating back then, I guess that's that's why so many children were lean and and we were much healthier. It's true. Uh, We have supersized everything. And um, people are getting used to it. It's the new normal for people. Mm-hmm. And that's sad because it takes, a, it takes a toll. Well, that's the thing. When you say, where do you want to go eat? Everyone says, oh, the portions are great here. That's the common response. So we're expecting large portions, and we very seldom take leftovers home. Well, that's part of the American, I would say, trance or sickness, where we believe that more is necessarily better. There's an old saying that a, a person with one watch knows what time it is, a person with two watches isn't quite sure. More isn't always better. Um, More pesticides in our foods is not better. More calories when we're already eating too much is not better. More fat in our diets, more sugar in our diets, more high fructose corn syrup, more artificial adulterants. These things are not better. Uh, In fact, they are worse. The more is better philosophy or mindset goes right back to the way we started this interview with how we view success, more possessions, more materialism is better. Yes, and, and more possessions aren't always better. Exactly. Because exa- you have to take care of them. They clutter up your life. Um, you have to maintain them you ha- and maybe replace them. You had to buy them. You had to, it's, it, all this takes time. You have so much time in your life. It's a precious thing, y- your time. Your attention is a precious thing. And, and it's up to you what you do with it. If you, if you pay attention to the shopping catalogs, and what's the, what's the latest thing at the mall, then that's where your attention goes. Um, if you pay attention other, though, to, to the people in your life, to what's going on in their lives, what they're feeling, what their burdens are, um, and maybe find a way to lift them a bit, to lighten them a bit, um, find a way to, to work with your own experiences of difficulty so that you can grow as a human being and become more empathic to other people, become more uh, capable of, of, of enjoying other people and appreciating them and, and appreciating the marvelous diversity of us that, that we are as human beings. To me, that's, that's well worth our attention. We're, but we tend to, to give our attention to the things. It, it's as though our society teaches us to uh, use people and love things. Mm-hmm. And I think, I really do, that we would be so much better off if instead of that... We used things and loved people. John, for someone who's sitting home right now saying, I'm only one person, can one person make a difference? 
you are one person, but I would never say only one, because only one implies that, that, that it, it sort of gives a, a, a slant to it uh, of, of helplessness or, or, me, or, or, or smallness. I don't think many of us realize how powerful we are, how magnificent we are, how, how really wise we can be once we turn our attention and make the choice to walk a path uh, of integrity and caring and compassion and honesty and, and, and beauty. Um, it's different than the path of consumption and status and image. And I'm not saying you can't consume and have a positive image and, and um, have high social status. All of that's fine, but don't hide it behind it. John, where can our listeners go to to get more information about you and your work? Uh, my website is John Robbins, R O B B, two B's, I N S, dot info, dot I N F O, John Robbins, dot info. And John's newest book is No Happy Cows Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Food Revolution. So that's John Robbins, dot info. And as always, you can visit our website, CYACYL dot com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to Past Joseph's podcast, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, take part in the book club, and be sure to follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. John, I want to thank you for taking time to visit with us today. I think that your life is a true example of how one person can really make an impact on the world. And I want our listeners, as you said, to really understand how much power we each have and what a difference we can make. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you for the good work you do, and and thank you for having me. This is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.